everybody, Scout Crafter here again. It's uh, midweek Wednesday, and uh, I've got a, a, a nice little restoration coming up. I think it's going to be nice for some of you. For some people, it's going to be a little bit uh, controversial, and that's what I want to talk about real quick, and that is that uh, a lot of you have uh, recently started restoring tools and having a great time, as you can see by all the channels that have opened up and everybody contributing to the uh, comments and everybody's having a great time. This could be such a fantastic hobby and it also, you know, you kind of, we were talking about walking the line and things like that. There's something I want to talk about is that with certain tools, and this has always been the way it has been with tool collecting or uh, whatnot, certain tools get nuts, you know, and some people get nuts and you always have to understand that when things start getting nuts don't get caught up in it it's like gambling it's like an addiction you know and and i'll tell you what i mean these old tools really don't have any value to them because there was so many made and the thing is you have to look for the future and i'm telling you right now the youth of today have no desire to collect tools. I mean, we like tools, a lot of us, because our grandfathers and fathers had tools and they meant a lot to them, so we want to carry on the tradition. You know, tools in the future won't mean much for, for many uh, kids because they're just that. They're old, rusty tools. They want, even if lathes, remember when lathe, when I was first getting into metalworking, you know, lathes were hard to come by and stuff. And now kids want CNC, they want all this the new stuff, They, you know, the old lays, you can't even give them away. People have to sell them for scrap. What a shame that is, right? So my, uh, my key is to, to collect what you like, you know, and I learned that from my mentor, Dan Semmel, who was a, uh, he always said, you know, he, collect, he always collected stuff that other people really weren't interested in, but he liked it. And I learned from that. I said, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to collect things I like. That's why I collect inexpensive and refurbished inexpensive tools because you know when you get caught up in, in these high-end stuff you know it's it's you, you can go down a rabbit hole with that stuff and and uh one of the things that dan collected that uh i've always been fascinated with was dan has the largest collection i think in the united states of these uh manson lathes these small hobby lathes that were big in the 40s and 50s and uh, he picked them up, you know, he used to get them for 40 or $50 a piece, you know, which, you know, I, you look at them now, you can't touch them for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So that was a great investment, but you know, it can go the opposite way too. You know, you can start like I had another friend from the club used to collect these wooden molding planes. You've seen them before, right? Man, they were spending big money on these things. You know what? The market tanked on them. They're not, you can't give them away now. So you have to be careful. Don't don't go crazy with this. And and what we're going our project today is going to reflect just that. Okay, so this is today's project. This is what I felt like doing, and this is what's going to stir up the controversy. I'm sure right now that are there are a few boys that are going to be a little upset at what goes on here. But let me just give you an example of what's going on here. Okay, what we have here is uh, what I have always found is one of the craziest tools that I've ever seen. Now, I can understand some tools going up in value because they're just so cool that even future generations will love them, like those Manson Lays. However, I can this thing is just a crate tool. That's all it is. It doesn't have any particular... You know, there's no, the Bridgeport crate tools are probably better made and stuff, but this one here... Look at the prices at what some of these things are going for. I, insane. I I was looking for these. For, for every They would pop up every time I would, you know, search for the crate tools I liked. These things would pop up at crazy prices. And I was like, you know, something, something's going on here. Something that, you know, and I'm not getting into that whole game. But let me show you what this is here. This, you could see here, it says B&R Manufacturing, Chicago, Illinois. This is a patent applied for. Okay, and on the other side, it says, it, you know, it's going to be hard to see, but it says complements of Kellogg's Corn Flakes Manufacturing Company or whatever. What this used to be was a giveaway that the Kellogg's Company would give away with, I guess, when they would sell their boxes of uh, or of, of cereal, their big boxes, and this would help. Or It's, it's a traditional cray tool, but it's got a spade on the bottom. And uh, I always thought that this is, although this is pretty cool, Nowhere is this worth 
anything that they're asking for it. So I happened to pick this one up and I spent a lot of money. I thought $20 was a lot of money for this. But uh, I bought it for the specific reason because I said, I want to see this the way it should look. You know, they're all rusty and, and, and they're going for, it's crazy. It This is insanity. So I am, I am going to take this and do exactly what I want to do. I'm sure we're going to lose the compliments of Kellogg's Corn Flakes, but this, I bought this for me. This is for me because this is something that I want to have in my collection the way it should look. Not like this. So let's get started. You know, this is something that I think a lot of us have kind of found interesting. And so we're going to weigh this thing and see how much we have to take off. So let's weigh it right now before we do anything, okay? So we're starting off at 440 grams, which is 15.5 ounces. Now let's take a look real close at some of the uh, issues we might have. As you can see, there's some deep pitting in there. And it'll show up more when we hit the wire brush. But... uh Obviously, we're going to have to reprofile the back here. Remember what the back looks like, okay? Because we're going to have to reprofile that. You know, that has to come down to a sharper point if it's going to be any kind of a nail pull or whatever. And you see with the head, the head is kind of mashed up. The face of the head, look at that, huh? That's not too attractive. And, uh, and I believe it or not, this is in bad shape compared to some of the other ones. This transition here, remember that transition line between the head and the shaft. That's always, uh, this one's not bad. But, uh, and then this thing here, this is, this has got me bedazzled. This little ridge here, I like that. I like that feature. So we want to try and keep that, but it's, you know, again, you're walking the line. It's going to be tough. This one don't have it on this side. Let's get started. Okay, here's our post wire brush. Now, we didn't do the whole thing because obviously we got to go over it with the grinding wheel. A couple things I want to show you. Patina, patina, not patina. And there's the rust that you see. That's why guys that restore tools know what patina because there's the rust underneath as the wire brush is taken off the top. You can see that layer of rust there. That's uh, what. But anyway, the reason we had to go with three different wire brushes here is because we can't do anything in he in this area here with the uh, anything else but the wire brush. So you want to make sure all the rust is gone from there. So that's as far as we're going to go with that over there. On the other side, you can see here we were able to get some of the lettering. And it does say compliments of Kellogg Toasted Corn Flake Company. That's what it says there. I want to keep this as much as I can, but the pitting, it's this is walking. Now I bought line. these flap discs off of Amazon and the assortment pack, and I've had pretty good luck with them. You know, I'm you know, this is a 60 grit here, but this one here, good friend of the show by the name of Terry Hooks from Sonoa, Georgia. Terry sent me these a long time ago. I've been saving these for the right project because he said this flap desk will will definitely outperform these by a, a great margin. They're made differently. It looks like a really high quality. He says they're great. So, Terry, I've been waiting for the right project. I'm going to try this one out today. Okay, you know what? That took me three hours again. And, and I didn't lollygag this time. And I was saying, I don't know how these other guys knock it out so fast. I, I don't know if I'm a slow worker. I don't know what's going on. But it was definitely 
three hours. To, to, it's a long time. I don't know. Going back and forth, different grits, and the, it just takes so long. Anyway, good friend of the show, you know him by Alex Schoenberg. Remember, he did that master lock, and I said, uh, do me a favor when you're finished, when you, you clean it up, send him. He sent me some pictures. He, he did it up. Look what nice job he did on this lock, huh? Beautiful job. Nice on a polished bottom and stuff. Yeah, so he was he loved it. He's having a good time with that. Okay, so uh, we're, we're letting the paint dry now. I'm going to go upstairs, have a little dinner, and then uh, we'll see. We're going to put this video together, see how much time we have. Now, you know my favorite part. Remember what this crate tool looked like before we started. And we're calling this project done. And uh, let's talk a little bit about what we did here. A lot of uh, interesting parts here. Now remember, and when we went through this, uh, again, I put it in a satin fit to try and avoid the fingerprints. And remember the face. And we said about looking at the face. Remember what the face looked like here. It wasn't too attractive. It looks nice now. Remember the transition. Remember I pointed that out. I said, don't forget the transitions over here. See how we did that transition came out real nice. Was able to keep, here's the lettering, BNF Manufacturing, uh, I'm sorry, BNR Manufacturing uh, Company, Chicago, Illinois, patent applied for. We were able to keep two thirds of this Kellogg's, uh, the complement of Kellogg's Toasted Corn Flake Company. And uh, okay, here's, here's the parts back here, right? Look over here. Again, we didn't go for a, a mirror finish, but uh, it just looks nice, doesn't it? We did it that way, and, and look over here. Remember we are talking about here, about that little, that section. Looks like a, kind of like a stingray. I was able to keep that. That came out nice, and it's lovely now, isn't it? It's so much better than, than it was before. And I can't tell you how nice this feels. I've been playing with it for a <laughs> for about half an hour. Now I could see how this would work. I could see if you jam this in. You know how when you have the flaps of the lid, you could jam it in, you give it a little twist, it pops it up. I didn't sharpen these. I don't know how sharp they came from the factory. If they were meant to cut through, I'm sure they weren't meant to be too sharp, but you cut yourself handling it. But uh, I tried to keep everything just the way it would have been. A little scout crafter red. That's the only difference. But other than that, I think that's pretty much just the way it would have been from the factory. So let's take and put on the scale see what it weighs and and uh how much we had to take off to get it to look like this okay now if you remember when we first started took the weight it was 440 grams or 15.5 ounces and now uh you can see here we're at 390 grams a difference of 50 grams and if we look over at ounces we're at uh you can see we're 13.8. That's a difference of 1.764 ounces. Okay, 50 grams. What is 50 grams? This eye bolt is a, he has the equivalent of 50 grams in weight. And that's the amount of steel we had to take off that crate tool to get it to look like Now, the that. 50 grams we took off that wrench, remember, we didn't wire brush it before, so a lot of that was rust and whatever. Somebody suggested that I should sell the patina, <laughs> keep the patina, and that is everything that came off that wrench, more or less, the ground up and whatever that was swept up from the floor. So maybe I'll, I'll wait till I get a full jar and, and sell this for the So team. in closing, that project actually turned out to be a lot of fun. And uh, like I was saying before, one key to tell if you think you're spending too much on a tool is if you get that weird feeling in your stomach like, I don't know, this is just a lot of money, then, <laughs> then you got to second think it. But... Uh, if it's, uh, I have the $20 rule, you know, $20, if I'm going to throw, even if I, you'll get ripped off, 20 bucks is 20 bucks, you know, but if it's $200, that's a whole different kind of sting, right? You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you have a great day. Take care now. Bye-bye. And remember, you can have just as much fun restoring this tool as you can restoring this tool. So choose wisely.